Welcome back to An Achievable Dream. In our previous episodes, we have talked about a broad range of topics, including weather routing and vessel preparedness for taking an expedition yacht on an extended offshore passage. In episode one, we took you up the Southern California, Oregon, and Washington coast, then through the inside passage of British Columbia from Vancouver, Canada to Southeast Alaska, then across the Gulf of Alaska to Prince William Sound and down the Kenai Peninsula to Kodiak Island. In episode five, we went into some detail on attempting to define the important attributes of a well-found expedition boat. Now, in episode six, we thought we would shift gears a bit and take a look at some practical tips, tricks, and lessons learned in terms of the commissioning, operations, and maintenance of an expedition yacht. This episode will be broken down into several smaller and more focused videos, starting with this episode, where we cover dock lines, fenders, and shore utilities when being tied up alongside. In future parts of episode six, we will discuss some thoughts on exterior deck equipment and maintenance, operational considerations, navigation electronics, bridge management, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilation, and chilled water air conditioning, plus a discussion on appliances, specialty tools, a general review of safety considerations, medical preparedness, convenience items, comfort, and preventative maintenance, along with an approach to figuring out sourcing and storing your spare parts and supplies inventory. But for now, let's get started with part one of episode six and taking a look at some of the tips, tricks, and lessons learned when it comes to dock lines, fendering, shore power, and dock water. To start with, dock lines come in several flavors, from the old-fashioned three-strand lines to the more modern double braid, mega braid, and now even Dyneema line. Over the years, we have had experience using all of these lines, each having their own unique trade-offs based on the application, endurance, strength, elasticity, UV resistance, rot, stiffness, feel, and of course, price. When lines are going to be trashed, like transiting through the Panama Canal, docked in harbors with notoriously strong surge, or in the Mediterranean, we are a big proponent of three-strand lines with thimble eye splices at one end. However, for general dockage over the past 20 years, we seem to have settled in on using the Mega Braid 12-strand lines as having the best balance of weight, strength, controlled stretch, feel, and ease of handling. Due to the point load of the eye splice, where the line goes over the dock cleat or bends over a rail or seawall, we add chafe protection in the form of ballistic nylon and or leather at those wear points to protect and extend the life of the lines. Dyneema is another remarkably strong and durable line. We switched over to this line years ago for use on our davit lines and for our cranes cargo, topping lift, and vang lines. It has about the same physical strength as wire cable, weighs 90% less, has close to zero stretch, won't work harden, fray, rust, and is much easier on painted surfaces like your winching drums. Dyneema's upside in terms of docking lines will be that for the same strength in terms of the line's working load limit, it will require a much smaller diameter line weighing about 40% less than conventional dock lines. It floats and is a lot easier to handle. The downside to using Dyneema as docking lines is that since they essentially have zero stretch, they will transmit a significant and unpleasant amount of shock and vibration to the boat in choppy or windy conditions. Additionally, because the Dyneema core has no stretch compared with its polyester jacket, these lines will degrade faster due to chafe at the eye splices. Furthermore, since the Dyneema line is 50% smaller in diameter, its point load, wear, and chafe will be far greater where the line is bent around a hawse, rail, chocks, or cleat. 
we have only seen Dyneema used for docking lines on much larger yachts greater than 175 feet and weighing in in excess of 500 tons or on small yachts when used in conjunction with snubbers or stretcher loops. I want to add a cautionary word about downsizing your docking lines. Several years ago, when we were blessed with an all-female crew, we had the brilliant idea of downsizing our docking lines from one and an eighth inch to seven eighths inch diameter to make them lighter and easier to handle. The idea was that these would serve as our docking lines during our six months cruising season, during the summer months, and when there is generally better weather. This worked great about 95% of the time, but turned out to be an extremely poor idea when alongside in a storm or if we encountered strong currents. I won't embarrass myself by going into too much detail, but suffice it to say that after a couple of seasons, we discontinued this practice and went back to using our standard one and an eighth inch docking lines. In addition to needing to specify your desired permanent chafe protection around the eye loop and splice of your dock lines, you will need some form of removable chafe guard to be strategically placed when alongside commercial docks, tying up on concrete piers, or when bending lines around pilings, pauses, or for use in heavy weather. Like most things on a boat, high quality chafe protection isn't inexpensive until you compare it to the cost, time, and hassle of replacing a damaged dock line. In addition to your selection of dock line material and desired chafe protection, your rigger will also need to know the diameter of the line, the total number of lines, and the size of your eye loops, and each line's finished length after making the eye splice. Here again, after many iterations, we have settled on a finished eye with a clear opening of 16 inches. When alongside on floating docks, we initially tie up with four lines, one bow, two springs, and one stern line. In heavy weather, we typically double up our bow lines, giving us a total of five dock lines, and in storms, we will add more lines. We often find that we need longer lines for our bow and stern, especially if we need to run them to the side of the boat opposite the dock in order to achieve a better, more perpendicular angle of attack. We almost never crisscross our spring lines due to chafe and, for obvious safety concerns, never run them across or in front of our side boarding door. In our opinion, the optimal setup is to have our bow and stern lines as perpendicular to the dock as possible, holding the boat onto the dock, and the spring lines as short as possible to minimize their stretch. Once secured, we will pre-stretch our lines by thrusting off the dock for five or 10 seconds, then thrust back towards the dock and take in any slack and retie the line. The right way to secure a larger boat is with the eye or loop end of the line on the dock so that all dock lines are controlled from inside the boat. This is an even more important consideration if a storm comes up so you can adjust lines using your warping winches. We typically see boats securing their lines on the dock cleats, which can prove to be a bit problematic and embarrassing when you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and find yourself being blown four feet off the dock with no way to get ashore to adjust your lines. If the dock cleats are too large to fit your spliced eye loops or you find yourself short on crew, you can run your dock lines around the base of the cleat, then slipping the loop over a single horn as shown here. This has the added benefit of being faster, easier, and puts less stress on both the loop and the splice. Indeed, other than when using our service loops or while wintering over, this is how we secure our dock lines during the cruising season. Another alternative is to run the line from the boat to the dock, either looping it around the base of the cleat, bollard, or bull rail, and then feeding it back to the boat through the same hawse hole. So once again, it can be managed and secured on board the boat. Each of these techniques can ease the process when arriving or departing the dock in windy conditions if you are short-staffed 
and need to make this more of a one-person operation. Your first mate or significant other will really appreciate this approach on those 5 a.m. departures. Under normal conditions, dock lines have a functional life of about seven years or four to five years if you routinely dock where there is significant surge. We cycle our lines each season using our old suit of dock lines as our winter dock lines and only use our newer dock lines during the cruising season. This has doubled the useful life of our dock lines and provides us with ample spare lines in case of bad weather. While on the subject of dock lines, and as long as you are already working with a rigger to make up new dock lines, consider having them fabricate four four-foot diameter service loops using the same line as your dock lines. If your dock lines are Dyneema, then you would likely want to have your service loops made out of a material with more stretch, like double braid or mega braid. The service loop should have chafe guard material around 50% of the loop, which is left loose so it can be slid into position. Service loops replace the need for using heavy chain and shackles when docking in the Mediterranean. They can also be used on commercial wharfs when tying off to pilings or on a dock with bull rails. In Canada, for example, all their docks typically use either 4x4 or 6x6 wooden bull rails instead of cleats. We use our service loops when operating in Canadian waters so as not to damage our dock lines. On commercial piers where the cleats are painted or pilings are coated with creosote, you'll be grateful to have service loops and won't end up ruining your nice expensive new dock lines. We've been using the same set of service loops for the past 15 years and they are still in good condition. The Mediterranean presents a very unique challenge when it comes to dock lines and securing your boat to the key. Essentially, you will need four aft lines, two lines running dead aft, pulling against the anchor or mooring lines and holding you a set distance off the key. You will also need two lines running at about a 45 degree angle, acting similar to spring lines to keep the stern from swinging left or right. We either use the service loops along with standard Mega Bray dock lines, or we use our three strand lines with large metal thimbles when docking in the Mediterranean. The thimble is then either secured to a fixed ring ashore using a D shackle, or we use an eight foot length of chain, which is threaded through the thimble and shackled together, creating a four foot chain loop. The chain loop is typically slung over a steel or concrete baller to shore. We also use this same setup when weathering out a storm or hurricane to reduce the stress, chafe and abuse on our regular cruising dock lines. Because of the surge in most marinas in the Mediterranean, you will go through a set of three strand dock lines every two to three years, which is another reason to use these less expensive sacrificial three strand lines with thimbles. Next, let's move on to fenders. For context and perspective, Oasis is a 70-foot, 135-ton trawler. We generally carry seven large 18-inch diameter fenders when cruising in North America, and 12 fenders is a minimum complement when in the Mediterranean. As a general rule, you can't have too many fenders. This is especially true in the Mediterranean. There are many occasions when no amount of fenders will permit you to feel like you have enough fenders. To help underscore this point, Oasis has been in three or four minor cosmetic accidents over the past 30 years, all of which occurred in the Mediterranean, all while we were tied to the dock, and all when a neighboring boat was either arriving or departing. Indeed, we had such a bad case of PTSD after our last three-year trip to the Med that it took us six months before we were willing to leave the boat unattended for more than a few hours or that we didn't run out on deck every time we would hear another boat's thrusters. In addition to our standard complement of docking fenders, we also carry two medium-sized 15-inch diameter polyform F7 fenders, which weigh about 10 pounds each, to use as handheld fenders when docking. 
One of these F-7s is at the ready, up at the bow of the boat, while the other is at the stern in case of any mishap or any unforeseen circumstance. Once docked, these fenders can be reassigned to the transom if our stern is toward the key, or alongside. It might be secured around pilings or used as standby fenders in case of an emergency. We have had these same two fenders on Oasis for 30 years, and no matter what application we ask of them, we can't seem to kill them. After trying all different types of fenders for the last 17 years, we have settled on using the Airy 18 inch by 42 inch inflatable fenders. We have been through several storms and at least three hurricanes with these fenders, including Superstorm Sandy while docked in New York, and have never had one of these fenders fail due to excessive force, stress, compression, or chafe. Prior to using these inflatable fenders, we tried using Megafen solid core yacht fenders, which were marketed by West Marine as the last fenders you will ever need to buy. This was in some ways true, as every year we ended up having West Marine replace these fenders under their lifetime warranty. After several years, we finally gave up and switched to the airy inflatable fenders. That said, there is no perfect fender, and every fender has its own pros and cons. In terms of lightweight, inflatable fenders, there are a few pros and cons that we have experienced, which I'll share with you. On the plus side, they are able to be quickly inflated or deflated for storage. We use our wet-dry vacuum to perform this operation, and it seems to work perfectly for this application, and there is no risk you will overinflate your fenders. They are certainly lighter and easier to handle than conventional polyform or tailor fenders. And the Ari fenders have D-rings located at each end of the fender, so they can easily and quickly be swapped out or reset vertically or horizontally. The fender line is attached to the D-ring on the fenders with a snap hook, so swapping out or changing fenders is quick, reliable, and secure. The negative side of using these lighter weight inflatable fenders is, first, they have a finite life which is in large measure dependent on the climate where you are cruising, the material they are constructed from, and the type of adhesive used when they were constructed. We have gotten seven to 10 years out of these fenders. Another issue which can prove problematic when you are not used to using these lightweight fenders is that they can get blown out of position when it's windy, which can be a bit of a shock if you get hit by a sudden gust of wind while approaching the dock. Our workaround to this is that if the wind is blowing greater than 12 to 15 knots, we snap on either 2.5 or 5 pound ankle weights to the lower D-ring on the fender. Once alongside, we retrieve the weights. We have also heard stories that some people fill the fenders with about a gallon of water, which never seemed like a desirable alternative compared to using the ankle weights. Regardless of what fenders you end up using, you will always want to use fender covers, which do a far better job of protecting the finish along the side of your boat, add some weight to the fenders, and extend the life of both your fenders and painted surfaces on the hull. Fender covers are generally made out of neoprene, acrylic, or polyester. They will all fade over time, but we have gotten the best results from using 100% premium polyester knit fabric. Generally speaking, when cruising in North America, we typically dock with two fenders forward and two fenders aft. As mentioned earlier, we also keep one handheld F7 fender out and within easy reach on the foredeck and lower aft deck in case an, any unforeseen condition were to arise. Depending where we are docked, we will also put out fenders on the opposite side of the boat for added protection from passing boats. On the east coast of the United States, we will often use the F7 to wrap around fixed pilings to protect the upper top sides of the hull at low tide. The simple trick to wrapping a fender around a piling is to slightly deflate the fender, tie the fender around the piling, then reinflate the fender. If you are boating for long enough, you will eventually find yourself unexpectedly caught in a storm, squall, a mistral, or similar adverse weather event while in port and tied to the dock. 
Often in such cases, by the time you are aware of the situation, you will find that your fenders are being compressed between the hull and the dock to the point where it is difficult, if not impossible, to squeeze in additional fenders. The trick in this situation is the same as just mentioned. You need to deflate the fenders, insert them between the hull and whatever it is you are fending off, then reinflate them with air. You will be amazed at how many dead weight tons of force a small fender can exert. If you have only boated in the U.S., you are probably a bit spoiled. Not all harbors are created equally, with many harbors outside the United States feeling more like roadsteads and are poorly protected from storms. Whenever you are tied up against a low-lying floating dock, there is also a significant risk of a fender popping out and you will be forced to float fenders in horizontally along the hull. With low-lying docks, we have even had fenders pop out in calm conditions because of the wake from an inconsiderate passing boat. In conditions like these, we routinely tie two F7 fenders horizontally to the dock as a sort of belt and suspenders, just in case anything happens while we are busy, off the boat, or overnight. While on the subject of floating fenders horizontally in the water, we have also found this technique to be a bulletproof setup for fendering our 3,400 pound aluminum tender alongside while at anchor. Having two or three floating fenders in the water also goes a long way towards reducing the stress of the operator when trying to maneuver the tender alongside the boat in strong winds or rough weather. The next issue is how best to hang these fenders around the boat. I've seen lots of alternative approaches, some more creative than others, but in the end you'll undoubtedly default to the movable fender hangers. These custom-made fender hangers work amazingly well. However, be forewarned, they are priced like jewelry. When made correctly, they are small, handcrafted works of art. They protect the boat, reduce chafe on the fender lines, and provide flexibility in terms of fine-tuning the location for where to hang the fenders. Fender holders are a must-have option if you are going to be boating in different geographic areas or where you will need to mount fenders both vertically and horizontally in exact or precise location, like when you are trying to mate up with a fixed piling or tying up alongside a neighboring boat. Custom-made fender holders are usually fabricated out of a high grade of stainless steel wrapped with leather on the exposed side and sheepskin on the inside to protect the hull and cap rail. They can easily run upwards of $1,500 per hanger. We have seven of them on Oasis, which have served us well over the last 30 years. Like everything on a boat, these fender holders will require some TLC. Some manufacturers of fender holders, like Megafend, advertise maintenance-free leather and are backed by their peace of mind warranty, which as far as I can tell is about as meaningful as a six-pack of abs by working out five minutes a day. The leather will definitely require annual treatment and the stainless will require occasional polishing, especially if you are operating in the tropics. This all comes under the heading of normal routine maintenance and at $10,000 for a set of fender hangers, it's well worth the time to protect and preserve them. It takes us about four or five hours per year to maintain the leather on our fender holders. It starts by first using a leather deglazer to remove any oils or glaze. Next, we apply a thin, even coat of oil-based leather dye, which if you do this each year, one coat should suffice. Finally, once the dye is completely dry, we buff the surface to remove any excess pigment and apply a coat of Resolin to help protect and seal the leather. There are a slew of hardware choices available when it comes to specking your custom fender holders, but all you really need are fair leads and a cleat. I am personally not a big fan of jam cleats as I have seen too many of these fail over time, exactly when you can least afford the distraction, like when a fender is trapped between you and the dock or another boat. I prefer a cleat which has no moving parts, nothing to fail and is 100% secure. In terms of planning ahead, if you go to the same marinas on a regular basis, it's super helpful to photograph both your fender locations, 
their orientation and dock line arrangement so that you can have everything preset in advance of coming to the dock. This saves time, confusion, stress on the crew, and means you will be able to apply the lessons learned from previous visits to that marina. Next, let's discuss boarding steps and ramps. There is a lot to consider when it comes to dock steps, ramps, or platforms, not the least of which is where you will be cruising. You will need a different setup for floating versus fixed docks or when docking in the Mediterranean. Other considerations to take into account will be the age and mobility of the owners, your guests, children, and pets. It is worth being mindful that the majority of all accidents and injuries occur when boarding and disembarking the boat from makeshift or unstable steps and from trying to use the swim step as the primary boarding platform. We have found that when tied to fixed docks, which is what you will mostly be encountering in the southeastern and mid-Atlantic portions of the United States, we use our articulating folding steps which attach to the side of the hull in different locations around the boat. They do a good job of spanning the gap between the boat and the dock. The angle, riser height, and forecasters allow the stairs to adapt to the rise and fall of the tide and any movement of the boat. Oftentimes, the dock isn't wide enough to accommodate these stairs when mounted at a 90 degree angle to the boat. So getting an angled platform will extend the effective use of your boarding stairs. Mediterranean boarding ramps, also known as passerelles or gangways, are a study unto themselves. They are available with an assortment of options including fixed, folding, telescoping, rotating, retracting, and more. Whatever setup you decide on, you will want your passerelle to be a minimum of 14 feet long 18 inches wide, and it needs to have a super secure, non-skid walking surface. You will also need sturdy removable side rails, illumination, bi-directional casters when lowered down onto the key side, a trapeze harness with a spreader bar for raising just the dock end of the passerelle to keep it off the key, and unless you opt for a fully hydraulic passerelle, a four-point lifting harness for retrieval and deployment. You will also likely need at least two or three mounting sockets like your aft deck and aft cap rail to take into account the different key heights you will encounter and banging lines to keep the passerelle in position on the key. As shown here when we use our upper cap rail socket as the mounting point for the passerelle we can use our articulating dock stairs and railing mounted on the inside of the aft deck to get up and down to and from the passerelle. We have two floodlights on our crane, one over the aft cockpit and the other light over the far end of the passerelle, so both areas are clearly illuminated for safety and security at night. For cruising anywhere along the Pacific coast or in the northeastern part of the east coast, we ended up building our own dock steps. This required less than $100 in lumber and only a few hours to assemble. They are safe, rock solid, provide a large platform for standing, sitting, stowing shoes, and is relatively easy to take on and off the boat. In North America, we use these dock steps 90% of the time. Since our fenders are 18 inches in diameter, we often use our dock steps in combination with the platform from our articulating stairs to bridge the gap. We find this setup to be much safer, especially in rough weather, icy conditions, or if we are being blown off the dock. We also carry a small, lightweight, portable telescoping ramp, which has proven useful for pets, elderly guests, getting motorbikes up onto raised dock ramps, and doubles as Serena's fluff and fold bench every couple of weeks when it's time for her to get a bath. Quality dock and side deck mats are also vital to keep people and pets from slipping when getting on and off the boat. After trying a variety of different mats, we have had the best success and longevity with commercial grade cocoa mats. They provide a secure footing and also have the advantage of staying in place on deck due to their aggressive non-skid. 
and are heavy enough so that they won't blow away in anything up to about 25 knots of wind. These mats will typically last us about six years of continuous duty. As already mentioned, using the swim step as the primary means for getting between the boat and the dock is not an ideal setup. Eventually, this practice ends up with someone getting wet, injured, or both. While talking about the swim step, having a pair of high-quality folding cleats, as opposed to the pop-up variety, on the swim step will come in very handy for short-term tie-up of tenders, a kayak, or other water toys. These cleats are typically not strong enough to use if you are forced to tow a heavy tender or for securing the boat to the dock and should not be used in anything other than in settled conditions. That said, folding cleats made by flat top are extremely well constructed, super strong and can be through bolted with backing plates. Next, let's switch gears and discuss the utility hookup starting with shore power. Most expedition yachts between 60 and 90 feet are set up with either dual 50 amp or a single 100 amp bus. As mentioned in episode 5, our preference is for dual 50 amps as it provides greater flexibility and far greater access to shore power. For the purposes of this section, we are going to assume that the boat is set up with dual 50 amp shore power cords and a split bus. Common problems with shore power can be low voltage, either because large boats are usually put out at the end of the dock, which is usually also the end of the electrical circuit, or the cumulative power demands of other boats ahead of you along the same power circuit you are plugged into. In most cases these days, docks are wired with three phase, so the 50 amp power is pulled off of two legs of this three phase power which gives you a starting point of 208 volts. During the summer months when the docks are crowded and or everyone is either cooking, running their heating or air conditioning, you can see voltage drops of up to 10%. One solution for this is to use what's called a buck and boost isolation transformer, which typically have a limited voltage range from about 170 volts to 270 volts. These transformers can either be fixed, have several taps for different voltages, or the more expensive units will automatically adjust to your desired output voltage. In addition to smoothing out your voltage, these units will solve any issue with shore power ground fault circuitry, as discussed in more detail in Episode 5. If you are intending to travel outside of North America for an extended period of time, you might want to consider going with a frequency converter which will do everything that an isolation transformer will do, plus they will convert 50 cycle power to 60 cycles, or vice versa. They will accept a far wider range of voltage, typically from around 170 volts to 520 volts. They automatically smooth out the output voltage to suit your boat's parameters, eliminates the possibility of high voltage spikes, brownouts, and will solve any GFCI issues when connecting to shore power. We prefer the redundancy of having two smaller units over a single larger unit. We are able to run our two 12 kVA or 50 amp frequency converters independently, which provides more flexibility and a degree of backup. Dual units can also be paralleled so that it distributes the load evenly between the two 50 amp shore power cords. This essentially mimics having a single 100 amp shore power feed, which provides more headroom, especially with high amperage loads from running air conditioning, heating, cooking, or the hot water heaters cycling. Dual units also facilitate diagnostics and troubleshooting, so that if you develop a problem with one unit, you can swap out parts or components to confirm exactly which replacement parts are needed. Another advantage to most frequency converters is that they have resettable kilowatt meters, like the trip meter in your car, so that you can track your power consumption at each marina. In some parts of the world, it is not uncommon for the cost of power to be higher than the cost of dockage. We have found on many occasions that marina's meters would read anywhere from 10 to 15 percent high. Here are two other points worth raising. First, frequency drives need to be installed in a well-ventilated area 
and or you need to have the ability to climate control the space. They should not be located in areas susceptible to large amounts of dust and debris as their internal cooling fans will vacuum up this material and deposit it on the control circuitry. It is also a good idea to install internal remote temperature probes, preferably where you can set high temperature alarm points to correct any ventilation issues before the unit's self-protection circuitry shuts the unit off. Most frequency converters are also available with remote display panels in case the units are located in spaces that are difficult to access. Second, with either isolation transformers or converters, it's always a good idea to install rotary bypass switches so that these units can be bypassed in case of a failure. Another suggestion is to install a pair of shore power active lights. This is a simple way to confirm you have active shore power on each power cord as soon as you plug in and switch on the shore power breaker without having to head down to the engine room. Ideally, these lights should be situated where they can be easily seen from the dock as well as from the salon and galley. If the power goes out, you can quickly assess if the problem is internal to the boat or on the dock. If only one shore power breaker trips on the dock, you will quickly identify which shore power cord and receptacle needs to be inspected. If both shore power active lights go out at the same time, you know that the problem is a power outage on the dock, located upstream from your power pedestal. Generally speaking, if you are planning on traveling within North America, you will want to specify shore power indicator lights where the LEDs will accept a voltage range of 97 volts to 277 volts. If you are traveling in areas where 380 or 440 volts is used, you will either need an LED which accepts a higher voltage range or to disconnect these indicators before plugging into shore power. Next, carrying the correct shore power plug can also be another nightmare for long-range expedition boats. The solution we have employed is to plug both our standard 50 amp 220 volt power plugs into our splitter or breakout box, which then allows us to take power from a variety of power sources and split the power to both our standard 50 amp outlets, which match our standard 50 amp plugs. We almost never need to rewire our shore power cords and instead rewire the input plug to our splitter box, which saves us time, permits us to carry fewer plugs and to easily check our voltages. In North America, we typically plug into a three-phase 100 amp, 120 slash 208 volt AC outlet or a single 100 amp, 125 slash 250 volt outlet. Europe presents an even more varied challenge, but generally we can get away with either a 63 amp single phase 250 volt or 63 amp three phase 220 to 240 or 380 to 415 volt plug. Off the shelf smart Y connectors are also available for splitting a 100 amp single phase 125 slash 250 volt outlet into two 50 amp female connectors. These units are not only very expensive, but exceedingly more limited in their application as they won't help you in marinas wired with three phase power, which has become the industry standard and the most common available dock power these days. In terms of shore power cords, our original 50 amp shore power cords lasted us 20 years before the insulation started to deteriorate and break down. We replaced these cords with black versus yellow insulation, which was about one third less expensive and have served us well over the past 10 years. The biggest single advantage to black over yellow power cords is that these cords never appear dirty and never need much in the way of cleaning other than wiping them down with a damp terry cloth rag. We figure that this has saved us a good 10 to 15 hours per year in performing the tedious, painstaking and mind-numbing job of cleaning and resealing our shore power cords each year. We were able to salvage about 50 feet of our 70-foot original yellow shore power cords, which we now use as extension cords or over the winter months or when we're in the shipyard. When we are in the shipyard, we still wrap our power cords with tin foil, then blue tape, 
then run them between two by fours if there will be any forklifts or vehicles driving over them. Although we are careful to always be sure that the shore power circuit breakers are switched off before plugging in or unplugging our shore power cords, the plugs can still develop hot spots and hairline cracks which can result in tripping GFCI shore power breakers. We ran into this issue a few years back when we kept tripping the dock GFCIs. We spent hours tracing the problem until we confirmed that we could trip the GFCI by just plugging in our shore power connector without any wire attached. We now always carry a spare male plug connector. Dock water is the other consideration when alongside. Generally speaking, your water hoses should have the following characteristics. They should be rated or certified safe to use for potable drinking water. You will also want them to be flexible, durable, to have brass ends and a minimum pressure rating of 125 PSI. We have been using the green line hoses for the past 20 years and have been impressed with how well they have held up. After trying all different lengths of hoses, we now carry two 50 feet and two 25 foot lengths of hose for dock water. We also have a retracting hose reel with 70 feet of hose for washdowns and other activities. We either purchase a disposable hose when in a shipyard or use one of our older hoses that is ready for retirement. It probably goes without saying, but it's a good practice to always purge all the air and flush out your hoses for a few minutes before connecting the dock water hose to your dock water inlet or when filling your tanks. We almost always use dock water pressure versus our own boat's internal water pump when we are docked. This is a great way to go and reduces the run hours on your internal water pump, so long as you exercise some caution. It is vital to have an inline dock water pressure regulator to protect your plumbing inside the boat. Dock water pressure can vary from 60 to 100 PSI, while your boat's internal fresh water system is typically rated at a working pressure of 50 to 60 PSI. We have two inline pressure regulators, before and after the bypass valve, as a belt and suspenders. You will also need a check valve, so if the dock water pressure drops below the boat's water pressure, you don't end up as the boat supplying dock water to all your neighbors. Flushing your water maker or engines requires a minimum of five gallons a minute. So we often have to bypass our primary filters and pressure regulators to obtain that flow rate. While on the subject of water filtration, virtually all larger yachts these days pre-filter their dock water with a sediment filter and or an odor taste charcoal filter. Sometimes you will see these filters sitting on the dock but more often than not, on bigger yachts, they are internal to the boat. Depending on the local conditions in your geographic cruising area, you might also need a filter for removing excess iron or other toxins. There are still many parts of the world where it is advisable to use a UV sterilizing light, as this is one of the safest and most effective ways to treat microorganisms in your water for viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and parasites, before they end up contaminating you, your guests, or your water tanks. UV lights are all rated at a specific gallons per minute of flow rate, so installing a flow meter and a throttling valve is also a good idea. In addition to pre-filtering our dock and tank water, we filter it a second time through a stainless steel commercial filter housing with eight 10 inch carbon filter blocks to remove 98% of the chlorine. This filter setup is good for 50 to 100,000 gallons depending on where we are cruising and filter changes are rarely necessary more than once a year. This filtration setup along with a chlorine test kit makes it safe to use either tank or dock water for flushing the water maker when it's not in use. When running your boat's domestic water from dock water, there is a surprising number of issues, complications and points of failure which can arise. These can include random changes in dock water pressure, supply or consumption volume issues, filter restrictions, or valves being incorrectly set. This system will be a lot easier to manage if you can quickly diagnose the source of any issue, such as low dock water pressure, 
flow restriction, a pressure regulator malfunctioning, or if the water filters need changing. The simplest, least expensive, and most reliable way to address these issues are with pressure gauges, which should be visible from the interior of the boat, plus a flow meter. To help us monitor this system, we measure the dock water pressure before the water pressure regulator, then again before it goes into the first pre-filter, and on the output side of the pre-filter. If we are going to be off the boat for an extended period of time, we shut off the dock water inlet valve. If you are planning and operating in areas with hard water, like Southern California, Florida, parts of New York and Connecticut, or eastern portions of the Mediterranean, just to name a few, then you should consider installing a water softener for the long-term health of your boat. Prolonged exposure to hard water will shorten the lifespan of your hot water heaters, plumbing system, and leave mineral deposits on your shower surfaces, sinks, your boat's windows, and the exterior finish of your yacht. When needed and operated correctly, these systems are a good investment and will end up saving you time and money. For those traveling outside the United States and Canada, you'll find that dock water hose fittings change from country to country and sometimes even from marina to marina within the same country. It is a conspiracy of threaded, bayonet, quick disconnect, and camlock connectors. The only way you will really know which hose adapters to have is on your way out of a country. However, obtaining these fittings is always relatively straightforward and easy in every local hardware store and just becomes part of the adventure. Also, keep in mind that once out of North America, many if not most marinas will charge for water. The price of water is increasing every year to where these charges can easily add up to over a thousand dollars a month. We use an inline water meter measured in gallons and liters to help monitor both our usage and the resulting water bill. Finally, a couple of finer points that we have found helpful when alongside. For any long-range expedition boat, carrying your own dock and shopping cart will come in very handy. These days, the larger cargo-carrying dock carts come in two basic flavors, either folding or, for lack of a better expression, collapsible wagons. We've been using the folding aluminum dock cart for 30 years. They are super well designed, indestructible, and the only maintenance our dock cart has required in 30 years is a tire change. These carts are well balanced, have a 300 pound cargo carrying capacity, have large diameter inflated rubber wheels which makes them super easy to handle in gravel parking lots, up and down ramps and over irregular surfaces. They also have the advantage of fewer moving parts, fewer points of failure and a smoother ride, greater capacity in terms of volume and weight and you won't wake up the entire marina dragging a collapsible wagon down the dock. It's a good idea to put the name of your boat on the side of your cart and to use a bicycle lock when left on the dock or in the parking lot. Finally, when it comes to docking in certain marinas, it's a good idea to have some laminated signs made up that say, private yacht, please do not board. And when you're in a shipyard, either no street shoes on board or shoe coverings required beyond this point. These signs may seem a little like overkill, but trust me when I tell you that they are not. We have had entire groups of people streaming on board Oasis, ready for their fishing trip or harbor tour. There is nothing so uncommon as common sense, and these signs seem to have done the job in deterring people from casually walking on board our boat. So this wraps up part one of episode six. In subsequent parts of episode six, we will cover exterior deck equipment, maintenance, operational considerations, navigation electronics, bridge management, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, heating, ventilation, and chilled water air conditioning, appliances, specialty tools, safety, medical, and convenience items, with an episode on general, routine, and preventative maintenance, yard time, along with an approach to figuring out sourcing and storing your spare parts and supplies inventory. If you wish to be notified of upcoming videos, please hit the subscribe button in the lower right corner. Your comments and questions are always appreciated and we do our best to respond in a timely manner. Our best regards and thank you for joining us for another episode of An Achievable Dream. All the best.